Coming up on The Cut, we talk about the juror's verdict on the conviction of former police officer Derek Chauvin. We also discuss the battle between legislators to make Washington, D.C. the nation's 51st state. All this and more coming up next. Good evening and welcome to The Cut. I'm Jessica Herrera. And I'm Pascal Bouchard. Thank you for joining us. The former police officer responsible for the death of George Floyd was found guilty this past week. Cut reporter Sophia Opfeld gives us a rundown of the trial and verdict. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin has been found guilty for the death of George Floyd. Jurors came to the conclusion just 10 hours after deliberation. In May 2020, Chauvin kneeled on Floyd's neck for nine and a half minutes, an act that resulted in his death. Chauvin has now been convicted on all three charges and could face up to 40 years in prison for second-degree unintentional murder, 25 years for third-degree murder, and 10 years for second-degree manslaughter. Since all of these charges are in relation to the killing of George Floyd, he will serve them concurrently, meaning all at the same time, with the maximum sentence he could serve being 40 years. However, he has no prior criminal record and could serve as little as 12 and a half years total. Last year, prosecutors said there were five aggravating factors that could increase his sentence, including that Floyd was vulnerable, he was treated with cruelty, and that children were present when the crime was committed. In October, Chauvin posted bail, but the judge has since taken that privilege away and he will now wait for sentencing behind bars. He is currently being held in a segregated housing unit in prison for his own safety. His sentencing date will be in eight weeks from now, with a precise date to soon be announced, and the other officers involved in this crime will be tried in August. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris spoke shortly after the verdict was given and said, quote, a measure of justice is not the same as equal justice. For The Cut, I'm Sophie Opfeld. A $1.7 billion plan has been created and put forth to help monitor COVID-19 variants in the United States. Cut reporter Madison Page explains how this will help the CDC and state governments stop the spread of new COVID-19 variants. The Biden administration has put forth a $1.7 billion plan to provide to the CDC as well as the state and local governments. This plan has been created to better monitor the COVID-19 variants in the states. According to Andy Slavitt, a White House pandemic advisor, these COVID variants, quote, account for nearly half of all COVID-19 cases in the United States, end quote. By having this plan in place, it will allow the CDC and state governments to find trends in the variants and strategize a way to stop them from spreading, otherwise known as genome sequencing. In February, laboratories were only sequencing 5,000 to 8,000 COVID samples a week. Now they are sequencing almost 15,000 samples per week. While there is an urge for people in the United States to get vaccinated, experts want to push to solve the COVID variant problem before we go into another pandemic. For the cut. I'm Madison Page. Washington, D.C. has a chance to be the nation's 51st state and give those living in D.C. the opportunity to be represented in Congress. Cut reporter Caden Ryback reports that this would be the first time the House has taken a vote on D.C. Legislators on Capitol Hill are battling to make Washington, D.C. the nation's 51st state in a vote expected to take place in the House later this week. If signed into law, Bill H.R. 51 would create a new state called the Douglas Commonwealth, a name that would keep the D.C. abbreviation while paying homage to the famous author and civil rights activist Frederick Douglass. Federal government buildings like the White House would be kept out of the state's boundaries. H.R. 51 would allow the more than 700,000 residents of the proposed state to vote on two senators to the Senate and one representative to the House and the mayor of the District of Columbia would become the governor of the Douglas Commonwealth. Currently, Americans living in D.C. do not have representation in Congress. D.C. voters do elect delegates to Congress, but these delegates lack voting power. Critics point to this fact while noting that D.C. residents still pay federal taxes without proper representation in Congress. 
On top of this, the federal government has the power to invalidate any legislation passed by the D.C. government, which is another grievance for statehood advocates. This would not be the first time the House has taken a vote on D.C. statehood. Most recently, the House passed the same bill last year, but it never received a vote in the Republican-controlled Senate. Despite Democrats now controlling the majority in both chambers, the bill is not likely to pass a filibuster in the Senate. The issue of D.C. statehood in Congress falls down party lines, with Democrats in favor and Republicans opposed. Much of Republican opposition comes from the fact that D.C. voters are reliably blue and would most likely send Democrats to Congress. This is Caden Ryback reporting. CNN host Anderson Cooper is making his dream come true and taking over as host of Jeopardy. Cut reporter Maria Stobbs gives us the latest on how Cooper feels to be on this role. After Alex Trebek passed away, Jeopardy has featured several different guest hosts, such as former champion Ken Jennings, executive producer Mike Richards, and most recently, Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers. Now CNN host Anderson Cooper is taking over to guest host Jeopardy. Cooper already has more Jeopardy! experience than other guest hosts, as he has watched the show since high school and has competed on Celebrity Jeopardy! several times. Of the four times he was a contestant, he won twice and lost twice. During an exclusive interview, Cooper reflected on his memories with Alex Trebek and the role Jeopardy! has played in his life. He said it was, quote, a dream come true to be guest hosting and to pay tribute to Alex Trebek. While Cooper is just one of many guest hosts until a permanent host is chosen, he understands how important selecting the right host is. Whoever you know, leads the show forward, uh, there are certainly big shoes to fill, and uh, I know whoever you know, becomes the, the host of the show, they're going to carry on Alex's leg legacy. Cooper compared his time hosting to his time as a contestant in a tweet on Monday. He said as a contestant, Jeopardy! is an incredibly fast game, but to his surprise, time flies just as fast when guest hosting. Cooper began hosting on April 19th and has already received great feedback from fans. He will continue hosting until the 30th. For The Cut, I'm Maria Stobbs. Well, it looks like that's all we have for this week's episode. Sadly, this will be our last episode of the semester, but we just wanted to thank you all for turning to us for your latest news coverage. And as always, for a behind the scenes look at our content, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at the cut underscore network and Twitter at the cut underscore ASU. Thanks for watching. Have a great night and a good summer. We'll see you in the fall.